Hi, this is Steve Holly, formerly of Wings, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Well, hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, a weekly show that we call Things We Said Today. This is the show in which we explore what's going on news-wise in the lives of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and you know me best for my Beatles program, my syndicated show, which is called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. We've got a special treat for you on today's show because we have a special guest with us that we interviewed a few days ago, and that being Frida Kelly. And Frida was a guest on our show when she was here to talk about a documentary on her called Good Old Frida. And Frida was the Beatles fan club secretary back in the 60s, up through the end of the run of the Beatles fan club in 1971. And we had her as a guest along with Kathy McCabe, who's one of the producers for the documentary. And we got to interview her because the DVD for the documentary has just been released. And so we're going to play a healthy portion of this interview. Not all of it, but um, it's going to be quite interesting what she had to say in sharing her memories of, of the Beatles and also working for Brian Epstein. And your thoughts about interviewing Frida, Steve? What was really nice was that there's no pretense with Frida. I mean, she's very open and honest and down to earth. And I mean, just like she is in the movie, she's she's is in person, and that's what's really special about talking to Frida. And 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 you know, the whole idea of the of the movie being made. There's really a uh, a little magic um, going on with this whole project, and and uh, it's really evident now. And uh, now that the DVD is out, now that everybody can see it, it just premiered on British TV the other night for the first time. And um, and so, I mean, everybody is getting to see it now, and everybody can, can see how how it is. And she talks about her life, and she talks about the fact that a lot of things haven't changed, and she still uh, is still, she still works, mm-hmm. like, you know, like a, a lot of us do. And, and so it's really, it's really kind of special. She's... She's a very special person. She's regular folk. She is. She is. They were very lucky to have her. Yeah, and uh, one word I always think of to describe her is genuine. She's the real deal. She really is. That's an that's a that's an excellent description. She's... And it was. And you really, I, I really felt that way, meeting her in San Francisco, uh, and the couple of times we've interviewed her now. Uh, she's really. She's just incredibly genuine. Incredibly. Yeah, I think that if anybody watches this documentary, you you kind of wish that she was your next door neighbor. <laughs> She's the mm-hmm. type of person you you'd want to hang out with, and uh, have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee with. Right, and according to and you, as you'll hear in the interview, not much has changed. Uh, you know, the interview has put her name out there a little bit, but she's still the same person. It, it, it's really it's really um, it's really nice to see that too. Yeah. Well, just to let you folks know what you're about to hear, uh, this interview is going to run roughly 35 minutes. We're just going to run it all the way through. She talks about a variety of subjects, what it was like uh, working with Brian Epstein, you know, how the Beatles were with the fan club. There is a story in there which we didn't actually get to explain what it was all about. So before you even get to hear it, which is much later on in the interview, she does talk about a moment when she fired a few of the uh, women that worked at the office is actually volunteers that worked at uh, the fan club because they tried to pass off their own hair as being beetle hair and mailing it to uh, a fan. So um, just to explain that for people that don't understand what we're talking about when you get to that point in the interview. So uh, why don't we just start with the very beginning here, and here is uh, Frida's explanation of whether or not Brian really enjoyed. I wanted to ask her if Brian uh, really enjoyed being a manager. And I, I asked that question mainly because I know we all we all know he loved working for the Beatles, but he had a lot of other acts going on at the same time. Did he enjoy uh, all that activity 
you know, all the hard work that he had to pour into not just the Beatles, but all the other artists that he managed. So let's listen to our interview with Frida Kelly. He definitely enjoyed doing in the beginning when I was around, but when it went to London and when it grew and he, then he, you know, he got involved with Stigwood and the Beach Boys and everything. I wasn't involved in the office then. So I used to just say, go down to see Derek. He was the, the press officer then. And I would, Epi was in the office. Sometimes he wasn't, but near the end, I mostly dealt with Peter Brown and Neil Aspinall because they were then head of Apple. Uh, this was after Brian Epstein died. So, and then, of course, Apple started. But um, I didn't really see him a lot near the end of his life because he mm. wasn't in the office Did... very often. He, he'd done a lot of work from his own house, from what I can gather, you know, when Wendy Hanson was his secretary. You talked in the, in the commentary about how different he was in the office and outside the office. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? There was quite a difference. There was definitely, yeah, there was a big difference because, you know, he was the boss in the day. And in in those days, you know, you have to remember, I'm going back a long, long time. I'm going back half a century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, your boss, you always called him like, you know, Mr. Smith or, you know, Mr. Jones or whatever. You know, but he, when I went to work for him, he asked me to call him Mr. Brian. And his brother was the director of the firm, and I used to always call him Mr. Clive. So there was still the respect of an older person. I, you know, I know he wasn't old, you know, when you look at it now, but he was old to me. You know, 10 years is a big difference in those days. But once we were out of the office, you called him Brian. You didn't, you know, in company, I wouldn't call him Mr. Brian if he was out for a meal. So occasionally he would take me for a meal, or he took me to the Empire and... He took me to a couple of clubs around town. But, you know, just occasionally, it'd be like a treat. But um, And also I saw him at parties. You know, Ringo's mum would have a party and he'd show up. Or, you know, George's parents would have a party and he'd, he'd call in. Um, but, it, you know, he was much more relaxed socially. But in, in work, he was quite a hard boss to work for. Hmm. Did he share things privately with you? Or was no. everything just very much on a business level? No, with me in the just day, it was definitely on a, you know, I was just, you know, a young secretary, wasn't I? Right. Yeah. Do you think that towards the end of his life that he felt like he was less important to the Beatles? Because let's face it, the Beatles took off and they ev eventually had more and more creative control over what they were doing. And maybe Brian had less and less of a say. Maybe he was disappointed about that or... or What's your take know. on that? I mean, it's not my place to say I because I don't really know. And I wouldn't like to assume, you know. Mm. I know it's not the answer you want, but I, mean, I have to tell the truth. <laughs> I have to tell the truth well, here. And I, I don't like assuming things. You know? You're staying, even even with the DVD, you're staying pretty private. You're not on Facebook, even though the movie is. No. You are not. Steve, when, when, when um, I was in, you know, I first went to the first festival in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a few people there said, oh, you should do Facebook, you should do Facebook and everything. And, you know, they kept on and on and on. And I thought, well, okay, you know. Um, but then when I came home, I th I thought about it and I thought, no, I don't really want to do Facebook. So I, I emailed them and said, thank you very much for all the hard work they've done. But if they, I hope they don't mind, but I, I don't want to do Facebook. And the reason why, it's not I'm being awkward or anything, but I work, you know, five days a week, seven hours a day on a computer. Um, I don't really want, I've got a, you know, as you know, I've got a computer at home, but I don't want to spend my spare time on that computer because I'm already mm. on one in the day. Good for you. But also, <laughs> Um, you know, can can you teach us how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hopeless on the computer. I use it as a word processor. <laughs> um, I mind my grandson on a Wednesday. I spend, I'm off, you know, Saturday and Sunday, naturally. So Saturday is my day. And Sunday I spend with my daughter and, and grandson. Um, in the week, I'm a social animal. You know, I like socializing with friends and going to the theater and going to plays. I mean, I had a great time yesterday. Um, there was a thing on at the cavern in the afternoon with all, you know, old 60s groups. And uh, we were all there and 
started off at one o'clock at lunch time and I ended up at one a.m. this morning. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, so I'm still very heavily involved on the music scene in Liverpool. So you can understand why I don't want the little bit of spare time I've got. I really don't want to spend it on Facebook. Now I know, you know, I, you know, Ra- Rachel laughs, but that's my daughter because she said. You know, why don't why you should do Facebook? You should get you know, in the modern world and all this business, you know. I still reach I don't want everybody knowing, you know, what I'm wearing or what I'm having for breakfast or whatever. And then when the film come out and uh, you know, the first show and all you know, you see me with the cornflakes and everything, and she just laughed. She said, Oh, well, you wouldn't do Facebook because you didn't want them knowing what you're having for your breakfast. You're just telling the world <laughs> what you're having for your breakfast now. But, but uh, I mean I you know, I'm not being awkward saying I like my privacy, but I do, you know, I I am a social album and I do in, do like things, but I also like a little bit of privacy. Mm-hmm. I'm sure everybody does. I'm sure you two do as well. Right. Frida, you, you talk about the cavern. You just talked about the cavern. In the documentary, you say that you saw the Beatles about 190 times at the cavern. Is there anything yeah. you could share with us about what that experience was like that maybe we don't know? Oh, I mean, you, you did know. say that George did a dance during the Sheikh of <laughs> Araby, yeah, which I, I'm trying to picture what it was I... like. <laughs> <laughs> I look so stupid on the film, don't I, trying to do George's little dance? <laughs> uh-huh. But he always used to do like a little skip on stage. And I just wait. I mean, I'm no good at describing things. I'm not very good at that. But I just wish Beatle fans could see the raw Beatles. You know, the Beatles before they actually put the suits on and, you know, started doing all their singles on tour and everything. But, I mean, you, you will get a gist of it by this uh, this CD that's just come out, you know, the BBC Live. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm playing that in the car and I'm getting so much fun out of that because there's an awful lot of George's songs, you know, in that, in that CD. Listening to those CDs, um, you know, George is coming over, very, his accent, his Liverpool accent is quite thick, you know, and uh, I, I liked the way he spoke. And I think Paul comes over very quiet. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you think of it, but he comes over as very sombre. And I thought, oh my goodness, I never noticed that in, George, in Paul. Huh. And I, lo- I love Did- the two interviews with... Uh, you know, well, I love the four interviews, especially the one with John, you know, because even then John is so honest, isn't he? You know, he mm. just tells it that as is, and I like that. That's funny because I've seen some comments over here from people who haven't heard those interviews and they thought they kind of interrupted the, the flow, but, but you're putting it in perspective that, you know, that's more of the way they actually were. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I like it because, now, you know, I mean, I saw... Paul, I actually went to um, Japan because they bought the film and to promote it, they asked me to come out, mm. they paid for me to come out and they they got me a ticket to see Paul, uh, you know uh, I just went to see the concert and then I left um, but something like that, you know I know Paul is great and, and Ringo is great and everything but deep deep down, when he does a, a Beatle number, I'm waiting for the other three voices to come in so, you know, I, I I, I say it all along. I'm a Beatle fan. I mean, I like some of Paul's stuff. I like some of George's. Well, naturally, I, I like a lot, you know, of John's and everything. But I still like the Beatles as a group. I like the music of the Beatles. You know? mm. I like the harmonising. And I, lo- I loved the way they bounced off each other. You know, the Beatles are, aren't just music. The Beatles are them, their personalities, and the way they interreacted with each other and the way they acted with other people and it's not just one thing to me Beatles it's uh, it's not just the music which is fantastic but it's everything about them and I just wish Beatles fans could have seen the rawness the real Beatles in the beginning in the cavern you know you'd all be hysterical <laughs> hmm. yeah. because you know you know the lunchtime sessions were very relaxed and um you know, one of them would just crack a joke and then the others would all bounce off that joke and then the audience would bounce off it. And they'd, they'd go into a song then laughing, you know, or or they'd give up and, you know, halfway through the song because they were laughing that much and have to start again or they'd say, oh, forget it, we do another song. So there was all that, you know, which I loved. 
But that only happened at the lunchtime sessions. It didn't happen at the nighttime. Right. Do you so you didn't you didn't talk to Paul in Japan at all? No. No. What did you think of the show? Uh, I, I thought it was good, and uh, I, I'd actually got his new CD beforehand, so I brainwashed myself in the car a few days beforehand, so I knew the numbers. You know, I do like new. I, I do like that one, yeah, and of course uh, the other one um, about you know uh, what's it called, Julio, Julio, who's got the ball? It isn't in my pocket. You know that one, Queenie, Queenie, yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's an old game. And when I started singing it, you know, when he, when I first heard it, my daughter said, oh, you know, you're quick learning those words. And I said, no, no, I've no, this is a game from the 60s that we, you know, we used to play as kids. So uh, she didn't know it, but I knew it. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great yeah. answer. Um, the concert, I, I liked the concert because um, I couldn't believe how long he played for him. You know, I know it was the last one and he was recording it. But he'd done about 31 numbers and um, he'd done an awful lot of, of Beatles stuff, but old Beatles stuff, you know, which I liked. And also there was only, I mean, I haven't got a lot of his albums, but of all the songs he'd done, you know, Beatles, Wings and everything, there was only one song I didn't recognise, which I thought was quite good for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> he'd done Band on the Run and Ram and, um, you know, his new stuff, and but he'd done a lot of Beatles stuff. I know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you know, I looked and, uh, you know, I was quite, you know, I had a really good seat, so I could see him. But naturally, I looked at the big screen as well. And you have to get into your head. You know, he's 72 years of age. He's flipping good for that. Yeah. And Ringo is. I mean, I saw Ringo in Liverpool. Uh, I think it was two years ago or 18 months ago. He played in Liverpool at the Empire. And uh, I went to that and I really enjoyed it, you know. Because I, I like Ringo singing because, to me, he's a party animal and, and I think that comes out in his voice because his numbers are all like Sing Along With Joe numbers. You right. Know? Mm. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I'm just talking off the cuff and my views on things, you know. People don't That's probably fine. don't think the way I think, you know. No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Uh, Frida, I've got, I've got to bring up one thing that's really important. Many years ago, back in the 80s, I've been doing radio programs on the Beatles since, since 1982 now. And one of the things that I like to do is to show the Beatles' influence on other artists or how other artists influence them. Yeah. And I played uh, the beginning of John Lennon's song, God, which has this piano intro in there. And then later on, I discovered this song that you bring up in your film, which was a big hit here in the States by Keddie Lester called Love Letters. Yeah. And, and if you listen to the very beginning of that song, the piano part, it's very it much kind of like what John had in the very beginning of God. So I also remember reading just recently that John had asked Cynthia to buy him a copy of Love Letters. And then what? you say something in the documentary about this particular song, which I think maybe you'd want to share with our listeners. Yeah. Well, the lunchtime sessions, when they ended... Bob Wooler, the DJ, played uh, just one song to tell you more or less, can you go back to work? And um, there were two songs. One was Ketty Lester's Love Letters and the other one was Bobby Darren, I'll Be There. And um, when Bob played whatever one, you know, he would just pick one. But it was only those two records that he played. You knew it was time to go home. And why I picked uh, Love Letters was... Um, I said to Ryan, out of all the records, I know uh, if any Cavanites or you know people that went to the cavern, once they hear that that song, it will bring them right back to the lunchtime sessions, because we all you know all Cavanites remember those two songs. Mm -hmm. I did, you know, I do love Bobby Darren. I'll be there, and I've got a friend in Liverpool mm. called uh, Beryl Marsden, who's a, a singer. Oh yes, a singer, and Beryl does yeah. that song fabulous. She was on a television program and she sang that with no backing at all. And you just, you just automatically, your brain just automatically goes right back to the cavern and the Beatles. Well, Jerry, because, Jerry Mars didn't you know, sing it with the pacemakers. Yeah, but I mean, I just like the two original numbers, you know, by the, by those two artists, Kessie Lester and Bobby Darren. 
But were those two songs songs selected by the Beatles or just by no, Bob Wooler? No, no, Bob Wooler. Bob hmm. Wooler. And rather than Bob get on the mic and so to say, come on, all clear off, all go home, you know, or all go back to your office jobs or whatever, he would just put the record on. And when either of those two, and when he put it on, you just automatically knew um, time to go back to work. <laughs> Because all the groups, they used to practice in the cabin, you know, after the lunchtime session. The lunchtime sessions finished a quarter past two. And then they would stay, or the groups would just stay then and, and rehearse in the cabin. Because you see all, well, there's quite a lot of black and white pictures of the Beatles in the cabin playing, rehearsing. So, you know, um, that just shows you that that's what they've done. And, and other groups done it as well. Isn't it? You know, sometimes... Um, when I, you know, I, I was just running the fan club and then I was still in Liverpool and naturally, you know, I would go to the post office or whatever. And I, would, I my office was quite near Matthew Street where the cavern is mm-hmm. and I would walk past the cavern and you could hear people um, practising. Sometimes you'd wander down and just see who was on stage rehearsing and then you just walk back up, you know, because there wasn't any bouncers or anything in those days. You could just walk in the cavern for free then in the afternoons. I don't mean when people, you know, in the lunchtime sessions, you had to pay. Um, but, it, you know, the, the cavern wasn't locked or anything. And so if you heard music, you would just go down and see who was practicing. How would you describe the difference? I mean, we've heard the the Hollywood Bowl recordings and, um, you know, and how they sounded in 64 when they were on tour. How would you describe the difference between the way they were in 64 in the U.S. and the way you heard them at the cavern? Uh, well, I I can't really remember that record to be quite truthful. Okay. The one you talk because I you know I mean I I on my phone now I mean I've got a lot of Beatles stuff on my phone, <laughs> so when I'm I'm on a plane or somewhere like that, I don't watch films. I just oh, okay. stick the earpieces in and listen to, okay. listen to their records or the old stuff. You know. But I mean, in 1964, there was to me there was still. You know, they weren't as polished as they were later on. Mm-hmm. You know? And I, I, I'm not being disrespectful there about, about saying polished. I mean, to me, there was it was still the rawness, a little bit of rawness still there and the enjoyment, you know, of touring and visiting countries until, you know, it got a bit too heavy. How raw, how raw did they sound when you remembered them at the cavern, when you heard them at the cavern, though? That's I think that's what I was trying to, that's what I was trying oh, right. to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I know, probably it's a wrong word, saying the rawness, you know. Um, well, I just remember, I don't remember the exact day, but I remember going down to the cavern with the two guys that I worked with. And, you know, Steve, it just hit you, you know. Uh, you just, when when you saw them on stage and just the repartee with, with each other and the the way they communicated with the audience, the way they dressed, and they just stood out from everybody else. I mean, we had a lot of groups around town. You know, Richie was in uh, Rory Storm, the Hurricanes, mm-hmm. and they were uh, a good group. But, they were, you know, they had, like, the shiny suits, and uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers were cleaned up. You know, they had the red V-neck um, not, um, jumpers, you know, with no sleeves, you know, pullover things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave Williams, his group, you know, they all had suits from, all looked very clean cut, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I saw a picture of them the other week and I thought, oh my God, they all look ready to go in the army, you know, the short back and sides. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so the Beatles just stood out so, so different. And it, you wanted to be part of it, you know. Anybody that saw them, you just wanted a bit of what was going on at the time. Can you compare what it was like when Pete Best was with them to when Ring joined? Well, I mean, you know, I'm still very friendly with Pete and his brother Rogue. I mean, I saw Pete play uh, in September. So, you know, Pete, Pete had his following in Liverpool. He had a big following, a girl following in Liverpool. And, uh, you know, when he, in inverted commas, left, you know, there was quite a bit of trouble for a couple of days. But... To me, when Richie joined, you know, he he was more lively on stage. Pete, you can't change your personality. Pete is a very quiet person. And, uh, you know, he's quite shy as well. So you, you can't make somebody into somebody that they're not, you know. And 
you know, Richie was an entirely different character. You know, even the way he faced the audience and he wanted to be part of it. And he was Mr. Happy, you know, where he's just, just somebody said he was like James Dean, Mr. Moody. I don't think he was Mr. Moody. He was just quiet. You know, he's quite shy. Hmm. Hmm. The only way I can describe it, and I have done it on a question and answers, is a jigsaw. And you've got the four corners. And Richie joining them, I think that piece just fitted in perfectly to the corner. Right. Yeah, that's what that's what okay. Lewison says too. I said it for <laughs> Yes, you pro- Yes, you did. You did. <laughs> I didn't rob that. <laughs> no, corner. you no, you didn't. No, you didn't, Frida. You didn't. There's um there's a couple of stories that you brought up recently since uh, the the movie came out. I remember reading something where you said that when you were in the film Magical Mystery Tour that you ended up wearing the same clothes every day. (laughs) You know, you want to tell the story about that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm a typical girl, so I'm into fashion and, you know, all my money went on dresses so your wives will understand where I'm coming from. And, uh, of course, fashion was changing in the 60s. I mean, you know, we had Mary Quant and... You know, there was the minis and I was into all of that. So I bought a dress every week, I think. And um, when I found out I was going on this trip for two weeks, well, originally it was for two weeks. So I had a dress for the day and a dress for the night. And, no, oh, you know, Miss Glamour I was. And um, so I put my most rubbish dress on for the first day travelling, as I thought. And uh, the next day, you know, when we the first night when we got to the hotel and then the next day I come down in a Mary Quant dress and one of the crew, the film crew said, you didn't have that on yesterday. And I said, no, no. I said, that was just, you know, a dress for traveling in. That was one of my worst dresses. And he went, well, you know what, Free, you've got to wear that dress because this two week trip is a one day trip, really. So go back and put that frock on. <laughs> and I was, re- I was gutted, absolutely gutted. <laughs> So I had to live in that dress for a week because <laughs> I only stayed a week. I didn't stay the two weeks. I came back to Liverpool at the end of the first week. That's a great story. Although I could, I could have stayed the second week, but um, I know I, I've said sort of, you know, I must have been, I, looking back, I think oh, you're mad giving up another week, you know, travelling with the Beatles. But uh, I'd had enough at the end of the week of the, of the uh, standing round in the field for the 36th cut, <laughs> walking in the tent or crawling in the tent. Um, plus, uh-huh. I, I knew that the fan mail was mounting up, you know, each day. And, and also, like Paul had said about what was going to happen the second week. So, you know, I thought, oh, I'm out of here. Two of the secretaries stayed, um, Jenny Crowley from the London area secretary and Sylvia Nightingale, her maiden name was. I think she was from Sussex. So they stayed the second week, but Barbara and I uh, came home. Hmm. She was from Norfolk because I had area secretaries for each county in England and three of them got picked to go on Magical Mystery Tour with me. Because it's supposed to be just four, four girls on a day trip, you know. What was your impression of this film? Because it was so freeform and experimental. Well, you know, I know Paul had a bit of an idea beforehand, and I only learned that afterwards. I didn't know in the beginning. And uh, I could see why he decided to do it there and then, because, you know, Brian Epstein had just died. And uh, I think, you know, it was to keep things together, really, or try and keep things together. Um, and, you know... They they had meetings of a night and they changed things round of a night and somebody would have one idea and they'd kick that around. So it was, it you know, I mean, I think he'd done his best. You know, uh, he got slated for it, um, but, you know, he did try. Mm-hmm. Especially when, you know, you, you, you're just really feeling yourself away in, around in the dark, aren't you? But, yeah. Do you like the film, Frida? I think it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> She's being diplomatic. <laughs> oh, no, I don't dislike it. Mm-hmm. You know, but I I think it. You know, so to sometimes I think, well, you know, what's all that about? You know, but you know, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I like the music. I like the music on it, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I, I like the first few. You know, the first part of it, but the second part, I just, no, I I don't. <laughs> it. Maybe that's 
just a and old age now. <laughs> Let me go back to PBS for a second. Did the um, did PBS leaving um, have any co problems for you in the office? Did did that cause any commotion as far as the office goes? You you, well, you, under, you you see what I'm saying? I mean, in other words, the, did the controversy of his leaving did that? Uh, cause problems, especially for you? Yeah, but only for a few days. Okay. Not, you know, it wasn't for very long. Because I, I wasn't, uh, I was, I wasn't really working for Brian Epstein then, but it caused problems around town with all the Beatles fans. You know? mm -hmm. but, but not for very long. Richie won them over. <laughs> yeah. There's a really interesting story in the film about, and, and which shows your loyalty to the Beatles, how you actually, um, you fired some of the members of your staff because they were trying to pass off um, some of George's well, it, hair. You know, they were it, putting it in an envelope. Yeah, it comes over that, you know, I, I fired all this stuff. It, it wasn't that. It was just three girls. I had a lot of helpers. I couldn't have done that fan club without all the help that I got. And they were just, I used to give school kids, you know, like pocket money. You know, and they would come in and they would just put photographs in envelopes and then bring them back to me, you know, you know, the following week and all these photographs and compliment slips would be in envelopes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as you can see, I was franking uh, this particular envelope and I, it was more bulky than the others. And when I opened it, I can see the funny side of it and I can understand where the 14-year-olds are coming from, you know, for a laugh, she cuts her sister's hair or whatever, you know. But... The Beatles and Brian, I worked for the Beatles and Brian Epstein and they didn't deal with anybody else in the office. They only dealt with me. And although it was quite funny and childish and everything like that, it was very serious. And I could not have let that go out because, you know, it wasn't right. And, you know, it, my head would have been on the chopping block, definitely. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I couldn't allow that. And I had, to, you know, I had to get the point over to other people. That, hello, this is not a funny or a, this is this is a proper business and we have to be above board and hopefully I got the point over. I mean, the girl is still talking to me. <laughs> so really, uh, wasn't that bad? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a, uh, they, actually you met up you met up in the during uh, at one point. I, yeah, I met up here. I met her in Lippo actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just coming out, out of the restroom when she was walking towards me and. I'm I'm quite good on faces, but not names, you know. And as she was walking towards me, I knew, you know, my brain was flashing back, you know. And she went, Frida, and I went, yeah. And so just stood for a minute, and then she said, do you remember me? And then I looked at her, and I went, you were one of the school kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then she said, do you remember sacking me? And I went, no. And she went, you sacked me? I said, did I? And then, of course, then she started telling the tale, and I said, oh, I remember the hair business, yeah. Um, but she had a sister who was nine, Sue, and uh, she still came in the office, you know, a couple of weeks later, things calmed down. And uh, I, I took her sister out to the Walt Disney pictures and things like that. <laughs> she stayed for Evans, you know, <laughs> it didn't like really go for me. <laughs> I think they understood. You know, I did get the point. Of it. How hard was the end of the Beatles for you? Was that really a, a really tough time for you? I mean, not on top of on top of having to shut down the fan club. I mean, personally, was that hard? Was that really hard for you? No, I to me it's it has run its course. Hopefully, I've done a good job up to the, the point where you know I I got pregnant and um, you know I was a married woman then, and they were all in you know we'd all grown up. Uh, but I'm running a fan club for a group that does not exist. And I'd done it for two years, and it was quite difficult, you know, um, trying to with stay safe face, for want of another word. And then mm. um, when I got pregnant, in those days, you used to leave work when you were six months. And I was six months at the end of March, which is our financial year and the fan club financial year. So the new year for the fan club would have been uh, April. And I was leaving at the end of March. And I thought, well, this is, you know what, a perfect time to leave. And um, I went to London and uh, saw them and, you know, George was there. I think Richie was there, but I know Peter Brown and Neil Aspinall were there. And we had like a bit of a discussion. And 
Um, I can't remember the exact words because it's that long ago, but I remember saying, you know, we'll keep the fan club on because there's other girls in the office that can run this fan club. You don't need me to run it. And after, if you know, a few, I can't remember, a few conversations and everything, it was George who said, you're definitely leaving, are you? And I said, well, yeah, I'm having this baby, you know, rabba, rabba, rabba. And he went, he, so you, you're not coming back? I said, no, I'm not coming back because I'll have two children then. And, you know, it's time for me to go, George, you know. And then there was like a bit of a silence and he didn't discuss it anything. He just looked at me and he just said, well, you know what? I always remember the line, you were there in the beginning, Frida. You know, you're there at the end. Let's call it a day. And, I, I you know, I know the words because they stuck it in my brain and I thought, yeah, it is the end of the day. And that was it. Uh, it's so, also a way of saying, what's the point of carrying on with the fan club if you're not with them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but I mean, there is loads of Beatle fan clubs and Paul McCartney fan clubs. And I don't know how the fan clubs run nowadays, but there was a lot of fan clubs after when I packed up, but they weren't official. I was the only official. Right. Because, you, you know, they paid all the bills. I mean, my postage bill was horrendous. Um, that And that's just postage besides your stationery and everything else. And uh, they picked the tab up for all of that. Their company picked the tab up for all of that. So they, I think they gave their fans quite a lot. I mean, we used to charge something silly like five shillings to join the fan club. And then eventually we put it up to seven and six. Don't start asking me, boys, what that is. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people could work it out. Mm-hmm. But they, you know, they got a lot more for their money. I mean, look at it. You know, they got the fan club records i mean they gave their time up especially to go in the studio and just mess about you know and talk to the fans because the only way you could get one of those records was being a fan club member right so i mean i don't know how much it cost you know i wasn't on that side of it but you know it cost a lot in the packaging and getting it out to them and everything and they you know they were quite prepared there was never any query about you know oh the fan club is too expensive and you know, it's costing us too much or anything. There was never any query about that. Did, have you listened to the fan club records uh, recently, Frida? Do you listen to them? I haven't. No, I haven't. Mm. <laughs> I haven't played them for years. Do you know, I can't listen to them anyway. I haven't got a record player. <laughs> I've got some records. We should get We should get you a CD of them. You know, they, they've been, they, they, you can get CDs of them. I mean, not obviously by put out by the Beatles, but there are, they're traded around. Oh, I'll have to get one of those bootleg CDs, won't I, Steve? <laughs> when you think back to the fact that on that 1963 message that George Harrison mentioned your name and then they all scream out, good old Frida. Hello. What do, what do you think of when you hear that now? And what was your initial reaction when you first heard it? When I first heard it, I was so relieved because, uh, you know, it still came in the office where the office was... <laughs> It was a place called Moorfields in Liverpool, and Silla walked in one day and she went, "Oh, you know, you know, they're rec- they're doing this fan club record, or words to that effect, you know." And I said, "Oh yeah, yeah." She said, "Oh, they, oh, they mention you," and I went, "They don't." And she went, "They do." And I said, "What did he say?" And she said, oh, "I'm not telling you." And I, honest to God, boys, I was sick because you know what they're like for Lark and about. <laughs> I, I had visions of John, you know, saying like, oh, we don't like her and she's the worst fan club secretary in the world and rabba, rabba, rabba. And I know they'd be joking. And I thought, all oh, these fans will think that they're serious, you know. Mm-hmm. So my heart was in my mouth. But when it came, you know, I thought, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> you know, and now especially, I think, oh, wow. Well. They, did, they, they must have had a, a bit of uh, thought for me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you're a part of history now. You're a part <laughs> of that recording. <laughs> I'm nearly an antique. <laughs> I mean, you know, where I lay low, for want of a better word, for 40 years and just gone on with my life and everything. And, you know, now my family's grown up and I've got a grandson and, you know, and all this has now come to life. I never, ever imagined, you know, that this would happen with the DVD. Because seriously, it was just a little DVD. We say to sit on the couch and just talk because I didn't want to write a book or anything. So I said to them, yeah, well, I don't mind talking. because You know, I'm good at talking. And, uh, yeah. you know, just tell a tale. So Niall knows what I've done. 
but I, you know, even now, I just think it's amazing, really. You know, I mean, you know, all these Beatle fans, you know, club together and I couldn't believe they put this target in, you know, to kickstart and I thought, you know what, they'll never hit that. Right. <laughs> you know, and I have enjoyed say my second time round with the Beatles because Everybody, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the film, but everybody has been so nice. And just the amount of support I've got, like from the two of you, I know, Steve, that you've done a hell of a lot, and you can as well. But everybody else, you know, it's just amazing to me. And I, I just can't see, and I don't mean this disrespectful to people or anything but I can't see what all the fuss is about because to me it's just a little tale it's no gossip it's no you know spilling all which I'm sure you know people will know that I could and I don't want to I don't go down that road anyway so I didn't think it would take off as big as it did but I wanted to get over to people about the parents not just my story. It is my story. It's not a Beatles story. It's my story for my grandson and Beatle fans. But I wanted to include the parents because, you know, the parents had a, a lot in this story. And I don't think uh, people had picked up on that. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to show that side of them as well. And I also wanted to show them, hopefully, as I know Paul and I know Ringo are, we say, icons you know, and they're very, very famous and everything like that. But I, I wanted the Beatle fans to see that, you know, hello, they were just normal lads in the 60s and human beings and, you know, lived like everybody else. And so hopefully I've done that. I think that's one of the charms of the film, Frida, is that you are the same person that you were then. And it comes across in the film and, and, Ryan and Kathy and everybody you know involved with the film has has done a marvelous job, as have you telling the story. And that's because uh, I took my wife two days after I met you in San Francisco. I took my wife to Berkeley to see when Ryan was there, and she was astounded. And all we could do was talk about the film on the way home. <laughs> oh, well, that's nice. Thank you. Um, and hopefully I haven't changed. I wouldn't like to think I've No, I don't. Uh, it, it doesn't seem, I mean, uh, compared to what we see in the film, no. It's not, it, There, there's no change. You're still, I mean, just sitting here talking to you like this, it, it's it's like watching you on the film, you know, it really is. So. Yeah. Well, then, well that's good. That's good. So. I'm one of you lot. I'm a Beatle fan. <laughs> and I always will be a Beatle fan. What do you think of the, the Beatle fan thing on the internet now i'm sure you've seen beyond what i do and beyond what ken does uh, you know the the way that things are now i mean it's not just a little it's not just a fan club anymore it's no. it's it's, it's yeah it's massive what do you think of how that how that still is today well i mean i can understand why it is because of of what they are and what they wear nobody will come up to them to me mm-hmm. you know um just you know you, you people say to me one of the questions it's always like what's your f- favorite Beatles song and now i think that's just you know no disrespect to dj's but i think that's a silly question because i think how can you pick one favorite Beatles song with all that material you can't you know, I will pick so many. You know, I'll pick Magical Mystery Tour because I was on it. I'll pick a song from that. I'll pick a song, you know, that will just remind me of George. I'll pick a song just will remind me of Paul or whatever. So you, you, you out of all that fantastic music, how can you just pick one song? Mm-hmm. You can't, can you, Steve? No. Nope. <laughs> and it, and it, it changes anyway. It all depends upon your mood and... What's and important also, to you at that moment? Yeah, or? yeah. And also, you know, I came back from Japan and um, I, I they, they speak English a lot and speak English. And you feel terrible because you can't speak their language or, you know, you try and just say hello or goodbye or whatever. But I was talking, I think it was in San Francisco, I talk, was, was talking to an Iranian guy and he was saying like how he learned to speak English just through Beatle music. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot yeah. of people, 
you know, I went another place and I knew these people could not speak English at all. You know, it was in Eastern Germany. And they, they when they were at school, they didn't learn English. They learned Russian. Uh, their second language was Russian. And so the o- the older people cannot speak English, but they can sing Beatles songs. And it hits you then how much influence the Beatles have had on the world when you're watching that. You know, I was in like in a theatre with all these people and they're all singing the Beatles numbers and everything. And I knew flipping well that they couldn't speak English. And I thought, this is amazing. You know, they've picked all these words up. That's what I've heard about the, the Beatle convention in, in uh, Liverpool every year. When you have bands from all over the world, and some of them don't know English, but they're singing Beatles songs. So somehow they're studying phonetically yeah. what the Beatles are singing. So that's that they're just copying it. Yeah, yeah. But they're, they're also picking up the language as they're doing it, which is fabulous. Yeah. Hmm. It really is. So are either of you going to New York in February? He is. <laughs> that's can. because steve is in steve lives in san francisco i live in connecticut oh, right. so but but it works both ways because there's so many events that happen for the beatles in in california in los angeles which is actually not that close to san francisco as i've learned through steve. true but um whenever there are events over there he covers them and if there's any in new york then i go to those yeah. so, are you going uh, are I, you going to uh los angeles um in october uh frida I don't know. It's manners to wait till you're asked. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I am, I am going to New York in February, and I'm bringing my daughter and my grandson with me. Oh, wow. Because I thought, well, <laughs> I thought, you know, he's nearly four now, so he'll understand a little bit of it. And it'd be nice. I'm coming for a couple of days earlier, so, you know, so they can see a little bit of New York. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm looking for, definitely looking forward to that festival because it's actually in the city in New York. So. Right. We will be able to see the city. And also, you know, through these um, festivals, I've got to know quite a lot of people. And then I see them again and again. And it's nice because, like, I can just go up to them and go, oh, hello, John, how are you doing? Mm-hmm. And, you know. <laughs> so um, I'm beginning to get to know, like yourself, Steve, I'm beginning to get to know people that I, I link up with. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to, nice to just have a chat with them. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm very good on one to one. I like one to one. I love talking to you in San Francisco. I was sorry we didn't get to to chat a little more, um, but that was that was uh, a lot of fun um, meeting you there. And and I'm gonna I am gonna go to one in October in Los Angeles. So if you decide to go to that one, yeah, I don't know that I'm gonna make it to New York. <laughs> yes. Yes, but I don't know that I'll make it to New York, but I, I will make it to L.A., that's for sure. All right. Well, if I make it to L.A., come up and we'll have a good Absolutely. Time. Absolutely, Frida. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be, I'll be at the fest in, in uh, February in New York, so well, I know I'll be there Sunday. I, <laughs> and I'll buy I you. Will. <laughs> okay, you got All a right. deal. <laughs> All right, Frida, thank you again. Thank you very, very much. Okay, yes, bye. Happy Christmas. Bye-bye. Wow. So, Steve, what did you think of uh, all the subjects we tackled there? I could have talked to her for a lot longer, and I I wish we had been able to. I mean, she's the type of person, the type of interview that you just want to keep going with and going and going and going because there are so many stories to tell. Although the the movie has a lot of stories, and by all means, if you have not seen the movie, definitely see it now that it's on dvd you know and get the get the movie by all means you know give yourself a present it's well worth uh seeing mm. and uh i mean I, I remember you know seeing it on the big screen and seeing it at home too it it, it, it has a as i as i wrote recently when i reviewed it it has a, an intimacy on dvd that you don't that is just wonderful it's just it's just really nice mm-hmm. yeah I particularly liked, among many things that we covered there, when she talked about what it was like at the cavern and how the Beatles used to joke around on stage and very often would would crack up and in the middle of a song have to stop it and then start the song all over again Mm -hmm. and have that kind of rapport. They had a rapport with their audience. I loved her description of that. Imagine what it must have been like to be her. I mean, not only working for the Beatles, but seeing the Beatles that often at the cavern. I mean, we, we did say, and she says it in the in the documentary 190 times. Yeah. 
Boy, don't we wish you, you know, uh, that's just amazing. I, the, the one thing that, that struck me was how she has managed to, even though despite the tide of, you know, modern tide to, to be out there and to be a, a social person, she's not. And as and she's she's kept to she's kept her privacy. A lot of people didn't even know during the making of the film that they were even doing it, and they still she hasn't gone out of her way to tell everybody. So, and I think that's very cool. I think that's you know that's indicative of the kind of person that she is. And she still is pretty private. I mean, she's careful about the things that she says. So when she does say a few things that are revealing, it makes it even more special. Well, and and. And she uses in the movie and in our, in our interview, she she said a couple of times, you know, I don't want to go down that road. And mm. she's, yeah, she's very, she knows where to stop. And she even now, when she could say basically anything she wanted wants to, she doesn't. She still has boundaries that she won't go past. And that's that's something that you don't find very often these days, especially by someone who is not the person themselves. In other words, you know, she was not a Beatle. However, she was so loyal to them and still is that she won't, you know, go into the, uh, for the lack of a better term, the Albert Goldman area. Uh-huh. She'd, never, she'd never, ever, ever do that. Well, she hasn't even come out talking about them till now. <laughs> no. And in fact, there are moments in the film where, and in fact, she she talked about it uh when I saw her in San Francisco, when I saw the film the first time, you know there are there are little clues in the movie about certain things, but she will not. She even then she did not go past those clues. She did not come straight out and say anything. So she's just a, a, the the key. The word genuine is is the real is the word. Uh huh. Really, the word. I can't think of many people who you could say spent a lot of time with the Beatles that hasn't tried to cash in on it. And she's, I don't know, how many besides her are there? <laughs> who had I'm, not some sure, kind I'm not sure there are really any. And, you know, it, it, it was interesting when she kept talking about Peter Brown. Uh-huh. And the first thing I thought of was his book. Right. Which was, really was a, uh, I've heard, you know, it's been called a betrayal. Because That's of, true. you know, the things that he revealed in that book. And she would never, she never has done anything even close to that. Right. Not even, and, and that's really a credit to her as a person. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I love when she was talking about um, Pete and Ringo and the differences between the two of them and the group and what it was like and mm-hmm. um, just stuff like that. And And I was... I, I had to make sure that I brought up the Ketty Lester song, Love Letters. It's something that's been so much, it's so important to me because I've been talking about this, you know, for several decades now about how the intros of that song and John Lennon's God are so much alike. And when you learn later on, as I did in, in one of uh, Spencer Lee's books, I think it's The Beatles in Hamburg, that John had written to Cynthia when John was in Hamburg requesting that record. Mm-hmm. It made me wonder, well, maybe John wanted Bob Wooler to play the song at the Cavern, but the way Frida tells it, that was Bob Wooler's selection. So maybe and what from... was even funnier was the fact that uh, that was one of the songs that Ryan says in the commentary. In fact, it was the song in the, in the commentary that Ryan says cost them the most to get huh. for that movie. Wow. I wonder and why. When you, when you, I mean, they had several Beatles songs, and... The Keddy Lester song cost them uh, more money, and and I, I'm I'm guessing that just about everybody listening knows that she was also on Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> we were talking about that the other day, mm-hmm. and it's true. When I started watching, I wasn't into that show when it first ran, but it, when it's been in syndication, and my wife loves the show, we watch it together. And then I'm seeing the name at the very end of the credits, and I'm saying, "Is that the same Keddy Lester?" Mm-hmm. And then you look it up, and she played Hester Sue in the show, and she was great in that role. She was. And, uh, no, she had the hit with uh, Love Letters, which a lot of people, a lot of music fans will also know that song, Love Letters, was also a hit for Elvis Presley. Right. I should ask my... Uh, I don't recall her singing during the series. I'm, I'd have to ask my... My wife is a devoted 
Little House fan. I'll have to ask her if if she ever sang. Right. I'm. Well, I wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me though that it, at some point she or she did sing. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that at some point she she sang on that show. So. Yeah, but I always love learning where. Uh, the Beatles got certain ideas from, and by no means do I even know for a fact that John w- that he was influenced or the beginning of God was influenced by that song. But it certainly is similar. But when you hear certain things like um, the beginning of some other guy, those two notes, and then John applied that to the very beginning of Instant Karma, that kind of thing, I find really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a there was a um, I found a uh, a thread on the Steve Hoffman board recently about that and I wrote, and I wrote about it and yeah there's a there's a whole string of those coincidences like that right and it's it's very interesting that uh that that happened i i don't hold maybe as strongly as you do that they, that all those songs were directly influenced like that but i'm with a couple you can definitely make you can make the case there's the uh, Dave Brubeck song um, mm-hmm. So I can't I can't remember the, the title of it off the top of my head right now. That has a similarity um, that really does is very close. And um, you mean to I think it's all my loving, right? Mm-hmm. There, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. There's there's a few musical notes strung together that that's reminiscent of the melody, part of the melody of all my loving. Right there we go. Yeah, and that that one I think is probably a better case than some others, but neither here nor there anyway. But I, no, I, I, it was great. And the other thing, uh, one of the other interesting points in the discussion um, was how Brian was different in the office and outside the office. Right. He was, he was a markedly different person. But apparently the pressure had a lot to do with that, and I'm, that's not surprising. Yeah, well, the Brian Epstein story to me gets more and more fascinating because just to be the manager of the Beatles alone was you can imagine the responsibility there and then he took on all these other artists yeah for and, someone and, who didn't have any managerial experience before this and having seen the graphic novel for the fifth beetle movie that's coming uh-huh that it's also there's some of it in there the movie itself is going to be even more interesting as far as that goes uh to see how they play that and apparently that's the only movie in the works now. There, I mean, there were other projects discussed, and there's been no news of the other of the other project. And and I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, it's going to be. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, very quickly, you have seen the DVD with now there is bonus material. Right. I'm going to be getting the DVD in a few days. But as we're doing the show now, you're the only one between the two of us that's seen <laughs> it. Can you can you let the folks know what uh, what's in store there? There are deleted scenes. Some of the scenes are are interesting. Uh, there's usually in some of those deleted scenes, or sometimes you can see, you can wonder why some of the scenes didn't get left in. And there's maybe one in there, but most of the scenes didn't uh, work as well in the flow of the movie, at least to my way of thinking. And, they, and it was right to leave them out, but I'm glad that they that they put them in there. I know in, in, when I saw the film in San Francisco, the the uh, one of the uh, audience members said, you're going to make a whole disc of, of, uh, of deleted scenes, right? And at that time, they didn't know. But it ended, it's about 30 minutes worth of deleted scenes. Wow. That's, all, that's all separated from... It's all, yeah, it's yeah. all separated. There's, they're all separated. You can watch them one at a time or all together. The big thing, though, is, though, is the commentary with Ryan White and Frida. And although they parallel the action on the screen... It's really uh, Ryan interviewing Frida again, and she's she's uh, giving more detail on some of the on some of the scenes in the movie. And there's very little you can hear very little of the movie coming through. So they're talking. There's a lot of new information in the commentary that was not in the movie itself, and so that really is 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 worth hearing. Uh, it's it really is. Sometimes in some of these you know movies with commentary, you kind of wonder why they bothered to take the time. This is very informative, very informative, and hmm. it's not your t- like I said, it's not a typical watching the scene, commenting specifically on the scene. It's commenting. Uh, it's more on the movie itself and um, further conversation that 
belong, kind of belonged in the movie, if, if you get what I'm saying there. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, it's very good. And it's also available. I haven't seen the Blu-ray yet. I've seen the regular DVD. The, the regular DVD looks fantastic. So, again, I, but uh, it's available both in regular DVD and Blu-ray, for those of you so inclined. Okay. So that puts a wrap on this show. And if any of you would like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at our email address, which is, tell them, Steve. It's things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And you can also catch us both on Facebook under our names. Mm-hmm. And we are there uh, all the time. We have a, we have a, a page on Facebook that the show does. You can send us a question there and we promise we won't ignore you. We uh, we make a point to to answer any questions. I'm always getting comments and questions from people all the time, and I will I will answer you. Right, or we could answer it on this show. Or we should we start doing that. Show. We've yeah. never had a letter. Never done a letter show. Or we could just do one letter per show. There we go. We could. Okay, and if you want to get in touch with me. My email address is everylittlething at att.net, and be sure to check out my own website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. There's interviews in there with lots of people connected to the Beatles, most recently with Mark Lewison, uh, Julian Lennon. These are all people that Steve has also interviewed by himself. Yep. And um, there's all kinds of trivia every single week and occasionally special contests, which I give away very unique items connected with the Beatles. So... By all means, please, if you can, take a look at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right? So uh, thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today. Thanking everybody for tuning in. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Beatles Examiner Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today. And we'll see you next time. 